Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verse 28. So it was that when men gave God up and would not even acknowledge him, God gave them up to doing everything their evil minds could think of. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness and sin, of greed and hate, envy, murder, fighting, lying, bitterness and gossip. They were backbiters, haters of God, insolent, proud braggarts, always thinking of new ways of sinning and continually being disobedient to their parents. They tried to misunderstand, broke their promises and were heartless without pity. They were fully aware of God's death penalty for those crimes, yet they went right ahead and did them anyway and encouraged others to do them too. Well, you may be saying what terrible people you have been talking about, but wait a minute. You are just as bad. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are talking about yourselves, for you do these very same things. And we know that God in justice will punish anyone who does such things as these. Do you think that God will judge and condemn others for doing them and overlook you when you do them too? Don't you realize how patient he is being with you? Or don't you care? Can't you see that he has been waiting all this time without punishing you to give you time to turn from your sin? His kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But no, you won't listen. And so you are saving up terrible punishment for yourselves because of your stubbornness in refusing to turn from your sin. For there is going to come a day of wrath when God will be the just judge of all the world. He will give each one whatever his deeds deserve. He will give eternal life to those who patiently do the will of God, seeking for the unseen glory and honor and eternal life that he offers. But he will terribly punish those who fight against the truth of God and walk in evil ways, God's anger will be poured out upon them. There will be sorrow and suffering for Jews and Gentiles alike who keep on sinning. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who obey him, whether they are Gen Jews or Gentiles. For God treats everyone the same. He will punish sin wherever it is found. He will punish the heathen when they sin, even though they never had God's written laws. For down in their hearts they know right from wrong. God's laws are written within them. Their own conscience accuses them or sometimes excuses them. And God will punish the Jews for sinning because they have his written laws, but don't obey them. They know what is right, but don't do it. After all, Salvation is not given to those who know what to do unless they do it. The day will surely come when at God's command Jesus Christ will judge the secret lives of everyone, their inmost thoughts and motives, and this is all part of God's great plan which I proclaim. a middle-aged woman called the doctor and she said, Doctor, I feel very ill. He examined her thoroughly from top to toe and he said, you've got the flu, go to bed for 48 hours and stay there, but you'll be all right. But within 24 hours she was dead. She had picked up a deadly disease and the doctor ought to have spotted it, but he didn't and she died. It was an inadequate diagnosis and therefore the prescription was just no good either. Now when you look at the world and say what is wrong with the world? What is the reason for the mess that we find ourselves in? Why is it that every single discovery seems to be put to destructive use? Why is it that every news bulletin is so depressing? Why is it that we can't after all these centuries just live together? and make this world a happy place for our children. What is wrong? Now there are many people diagnosing the world's disease and ill. 
and coming up with an inadequate diagnosis and therefore a bad prescription. For example, there are those who say that the real root problem of the world is ignorance and therefore their prescription is education. And they say if we can get all the education we need, the ignorance will be taken away and we shall be all right. And then there are those who say that the real root cause of all our problems is our mortality. The ancient Egypt, Egyptians felt this. And they felt that the main cause for the troubles in our world is that people are just getting useful to us when they die. And so they developed the answer of embalming their dead hoping that this would be a long-term solution to the world problem. And you can go and visit Egyptian mummies in the museums. There are those who feel that the basic root of all our problems is individuality. Many Indians believe this. And that therefore we must achieve a, a state of nirvana in which we are out of ourselves. And as soon as we get away from the individuality of ourself and get lost in something or other behind the universe, our problems will be over. The communists tell me that the root problem behind all others is the system of capitalism. And once capitalism is abolished and collectivism is practiced, then all our problems will vanish. The communist genuinely believes that we'll be able to banish the police and all laws once we've banished the wrong system and got the economy right. And all these people and many others, I could just go on listing them. People have had so many ideas as to what's wrong with the world. This book from which I preach every Sunday says the real root problem of it all is sin. And that's my subject for tonight. Or to put it more directly, the real reason why we never seem able to get on top of our problems in the world is that every man and woman in the world is a sinner. Now that's the diagnosis of the Bible. And I want to tell you tonight what is meant by this word sinner. It is a much misunderstood word and two people walking uh, near a church, one of whom had been inside it, were talking and one said to the other, well what was he on about tonight? And the other said he was on about sin and on about 20 minutes. And uh, this was a general impression given and I'm afraid it often is. I'm not afraid it is but the church is on about sin, it's always using the word. And we mean by the word sinner and the word sinner something quite different to the connotations given by the world to these words. It's easy enough to think of a cannibal on some desert island eating his ante up as a sinner. It's easy to think of these men who have committed this dreadful murder in Canada as sinners. It's not so easy to look at those nice respectable people next door and say they're sinners. And it's even harder to look into your own heart and say God be merciful to me, a sinner. Especially if we've been brought up right and if we've never gone off the rails and never been in trouble with the police. What is a sinner? Now I'm afraid I've got bad news for you tonight because the gospel is bad news before it's good news. I want to tell you what we mean when we say that everyone is a sinner. I want to go right down to the depths of this disease. I will talk about the symptoms first, but I'm going to go right down to what is the root meaning of this word sin. You've got to go very, very deep into human nature to discover what you mean and to discover the disease from which we need to be cured. Now here's the first thing. We are all sinners in conduct. In other words, the first definition of sin I want to give you is something that we do. And here it is, it's from the first letter of John chapter 3 verse 4, sin is a transgression of the law. And in this sense that sin is doing wrong things in God's sight, the Bible goes on to say there is no man that sinneth not. There is no difference, for all have sinned. It is the law that tells us this, as we saw this morning. Now I heard of two cowboys who went to church one day, and they set off from their ranch, and they rode across the prairie, and they sang and they whistled as cowboys do, and they got to church, and there was a real old-fashioned minister who took them through the Ten Commandments. 
And as they came out of church, they were strangely silent, and they rode home in silence, and finally one said to the other, well, gee, I guess I never made any graven images anyway. And the other said, well, I guess I never did either. And a minute or two later, they'd begun to whistle and sing, and by the time they got home, they were just as happy as when they'd set out. They were happy because they hadn't broken one of the Ten Commandments. There was a little old Church of England somewhere where the squire used to come and sit in the front pew. And when the vicar read out the Ten Commandments, he used to shout out after everyone, Never did that, vicar! Thou shalt not steal! Never did that, vicar! From the front pew. I wonder how far you can really go through the Ten Commandments and say that. When you really look at them through the eyes of Christ and realize what he called murder, what he called adultery, what he called stealing, when you consider that the very first commandment says that God should be first in your life and have prior claim on your attention and affections, when you consider that one of them tells us to give at least a seventh of our time to his worship, to resting in his peace, when you consider that the very last one tells you not to be greedy for the things that other people have, is there anyone who could say with the old squire, never did that vicar? It is through looking at God's commandments that we discover that we have all sinned. That there isn't one of us who hasn't broken the laws at some point. And to break them at one point according to the Bible is to break them all. The law of God is like a chain. It's not a series of separate laws. It's a chain of character, of behavior. And if you break one link, the whole chain becomes useless. You've broken the law. It's become something that no longer applies to your life. The whole thing has been broken, even if you broke it at one point. And if you and I have only broken the commandments once a day for the last 30 years, my mathematics tells me that that's 10,000 sins at least that are going to be dealt with one day. And he would be a bold man who would say, I've kept my sins down to one a day, especially if you consider that the commandments are positive as well as negative, and therefore sins are not only the things you do that are wrong, but the things you don't do that are right. And you confessed in that general confession tonight, we have left undone the things we have ought to have done, and we have done the things we ought not to have done. Well, if you've managed to keep it to one a day, you're unusual, and that already numbers thousands. So when we say that a man is a sinner, we mean first that he's broken the laws of God. But what about those who've never heard the Ten Commandments? According to the lesson I read, that does not matter. God has written into everyone's conscience a measure of understanding of right and wrong. And if a man can look me in the face and say, I never knew any of the Ten Commandments, I don't know what you're talking about, then I say to him, can you look me in the face and say, I have always lived up to what my conscience said was right. I have never gone against my conscience. And there is not a man or woman in the world can stand up and say that. Even if they never heard of the Bible, God has written his laws into their very nature. There is not a cannibal on a desert island in the South Seas who doesn't have a conscience. There is not an aborigine in the backwoods of Australia who doesn't have a conscience. There is not a stockbroker on the London Stock Exchange who doesn't have a conscience. It's the one thing that makes us human. But if that's all I had to say about sin, then I wouldn't come anywhere near the seriousness of the Bible diagnosis. It's only the first thing. We are all sinners in conduct what we do. The second thing the Bible goes on to say is that we are all sinners in character what we are. The trouble is that when I do something, that has an effect on me. I cannot be the same again. The first time I've stolen is something that turns me to a degree into a thief. And if I go on stealing, I become an habitual thief. In other words, as the old proverb says, sow an act, re reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. It's not just that I have sinned, it is that I am a sinner. My character has taken on the color of what I've done. 
it's inside as well as outside it's not just my behavior it's deep down inside here and this is why of the seven deadly sins I can't just remember them all offhand but most of them are not so much acts as attitudes of personality pride sloth lust envy these are not things that you do they're things that you are and I suppose the worst of them is pride the more I sin the more I sin and that little letter becomes the capital letter of my life and if I'm a sinner it's because the I is right at the center and self is my main concern and it taints everything I do I don't suppose that you come up against this understanding of yourself as a sinner that it's inside you and not just what you've done until you meet Jesus and when you look at him you feel somehow I am a sinner depart from me for I am a sinful man O Lord my wife at one stage in her life was the secretary to a doctor on a mobile x-ray unit and that unit traveled around you've seen them big cream vans with a Land Rover generator towing them and she told me this she said in the very areas where tuberculosis was most likely to be found those were the very areas where people would not come and have an x-ray the very place where we could help by saying you've got a disease in you that must be dealt with the very place that these things were produced for were the places in which people wouldn't come and face the truth that keeps some people away from church too because when you come under the sound of God's word you have an x-ray you see deep down into what you are this book is a mirror it calls itself a mirror and as one old lady said I don't read my Bible she said my Bible reads me that was a very honest comment she saw that she was a sinner as she read this not just what she did but what she was every man is a sinner in conduct every man is a sinner in character but how much of his character or to put it more simply are we black white piebald or gray in nature there's a question for you black white piebald or gray according to my Bible thirdly we are all sinners and for want of alliteration I use this word we are all sinners in completeness this is an even more difficult diagnosis to accept but the Bible clearly teaches it it sometimes takes us years to come to the conclusion that Paul came to in Romans 7 I know that in me there is no good thing theologians have called this the total depravity of men now let's get it right what does it mean that man is incapable of doing anything good no Jesus himself said if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children an evil man can give good things to his children Jesus however did not say man is a mixture of good and evil and the good part of his character is able to give good gifts to his children he said if you being evil furthermore he said on another occasion there is no one good except God no one and indeed if you run through the Bible you find this completeness everywhere there is none that doeth good no not one Psalm 14 quoted in Romans 3 there is none righteous no not one we are all as an unclean thing and our righteousness is as Isaiah put it in very direct but forceful language our righteousness is as a menstrual cloth a filthy rag now this is the kind of language the Bible uses that even the best things we've done are spoiled by sin have you ever sung that hymn well I'm sure you have that ask God to let his pitying glance fall not only on our sins but on our devotions too it takes a long time for some people to accept the Bible diagnosis that I'm not a, a basically good person who does bad things I'm basically a bad person who's done good things and what we mean by saying that man is totally depraved is this that anything good is due to God's influence on him that if I've managed to do anything good in my life I don't get the credit because I'm not responsible 
that if God had left me to my own devices, I'd have gone down and down and down. That God in his gracious mercy enabled me to do good things, not because I am good, but because he is good and his spirit is still striving with men. But that if he once let go his grip on me and if he once withdrew his spirit from the world, men would do exactly what happened in Genesis 6 and violence would fill the earth and every imagination of his heart would be only evil continually. It is only because God influences by his spirit human beings that they are able to do anything good at all. Now if you accept this diagnosis that all of us are bad through and through and that if there's anything good in our life it's due to God then three things follow. First, no age is worse than any other. I'm often asked if I think young people today are worse than they were 30 years ago. Well, of course, I always say yes because I was a young person 30 years ago. But you see, you can't talk like that. It isn't as if generations get better or worse. They're all bad. That's the Bible teaching so that we must never fall into the trap of saying men are getting worse. They're not. They're no better and they're no worse than Adam in the Garden of Eden. Secondly, it means that no race is worse than another. How easy it is to blame the Russians or the Chinese or the Germans or somebody else and say they're the baddies. They are causing the troubles. If we could get rid of them, everything would be all right. But if you believe in the total depravity of men, you believe that we're all as bad, British included. And it means thirdly that no person is worse than another. One of the most hypocritical things you can do is to say of these men who've done this dastardly act in Canada, well, I could never do a thing like that. Do you think they're not human beings who did that? It's so easy to point a finger at a Hitler and say, well, he's terrible, he's totally depraved, but he was a human being. He was part of our race, and you're part of the race. And it's so easy to point a finger and say, those are the bad people. But if what I've said is right, no one is any better than anyone else, and we are all capable of these things. I'm not going to eat human flesh for my supper tonight, but that's no virtue. That's no credit to me. It just simply states that I wasn't born in Fiji a hundred years ago. Had I been, I might have been going home to live on my relatives tonight. But I wasn't born a hundred years ago in Fiji, so I'm not a cannibal. I would have been under those circumstances. And therefore we don't blame anyone for being worse than anyone else. We're all sinners. We're all bad in completeness. And if there's anything good in my life, it's because God influenced my life. Praise him that he didn't let me go any lower. But I still haven't got as deep as the Bible goes. We are sinners in conduct, what we do. We're sinners in character, what we are. We're sinners in completeness. All our nature is that way. And fourthly, we are sinners in constitution. We were born with a congenital disease called sin. The Bible makes no bones about this. King David, when he'd sinned, praying about it, pouring out his soul in agony, said this, in sin did my mother conceive me. Now he didn't mean that the sex act is sin and that's a wrong interpretation. What he meant was, I've realized my nature was like this at birth. I was born of the flesh, I was born of sinful men and women. He's not trying to blame his mother, he's not trying to excuse himself. He's facing the fact that he's always been like this. If you want this brought home, let me ask you questions that I heard a preacher ask a congregation at the Filey Holiday Crusade. He said, did anyone need to teach you to be dishonest? No. They only had to teach you to be, dis to be honest. Did anyone have to teach you to be rude? No. They only had to teach you to be courteous. Did any, uh, anybody have to teach you to be bad? No. They only had to teach you to be good. That's a striking fact. Do you know my children learned as yours did to say the word no before they learned to say the word yes. Didn't yours? Little boy at school said his name was Johnny Don't because that's what his mother always called him. <laughs> Go and find out what Johnny's doing and stop him. 
And you know as well as I do that one of the tragedies of having children is that you realize you've passed on a sinful nature to them. How urgent it is for us parents to pray for our children. We've brought them into a sinful world by an act of our flesh and our flesh carries sin with it into their nature. That's the Bible teaching. Now don't get me wrong, the Bible does not say you can blame your father and your grandfather for everything you do. The Lord still holds you responsible for what you've done with your life and you know that you are. Said a young man one day to me, he came into the office of the RF chaplain and he sat there and he was so upset about something he'd done, his nose was bleeding out of emotion and his face was just drenched with tears. I'll never forget the sight of his face. And then he looked up and he said, Padre, if you'd been brought up as I was brought up, you'd have done the same thing. And I said, yes, I think that's probably true. But I would still be ashamed of it. And I'd still feel responsible for it. And so do you. And he said, yes, I do. And he found forgiveness. He knew that even though you were brought up this way, even though you inherited this sinful nature, in the last analysis you are responsible to God for what you do. And if you find that logically difficult, life is wider than logic. But I'm still not finished. There is one more thing. We are sinners in conduct, what we've done. We are sinners in character, what we've been. We are sinners in completeness. There is no good thing in me unless God put it there. We are sinners in constitution. We've been like that way, like that from the day we were born. We're part of a sinful humanity. The last thing, we are sinners in condemnation. In other words, we stand under the condemnation of God. I wonder if I could put it like this. Imagine a tree that is diseased. You can say, well, look at the leaves. The leaves have red spots all over them. So obviously there is disease in the leaves, but a gardener will say, ah, but there must be disease in the branches if it's showing in the leaves. And then he'll go on to say it must be in the trunk if it's showing in the branches and the leaves. And then he will say it's probably in the roots too. And he'll finally say, I think we'll leave that tree alone and then pull it down. Now that's what God says about sinners. It's not just that it shows in the leaves in what they do and it's not just in the branches of what they are. It's in the trunk. It's completely right through the tree and it's in the root of their very constitution in their birth. So God says we'll cut that tree down after leaving it alone. What condemnation are we under? We are under this. That if we give God up in this life, God will give us up and increasingly that nature will drag us down. He will remove the restraints if we say, God, I don't believe in you or I'm not interested in you. He removes the brakes. And if you take the brakes off a car that is on a hill, down it goes. And if you take the brakes off human nature, down it goes. Those who plead to abolish laws and restrictions don't know what they're saying. Human nature will go down if you do. And the other thing is this. God has decreed that sinners shall die and that that death will affect body, mind and soul. And if you die spiritually, you cease to be a human being. What is it makes me a human being? It is that I have a relationship to God. If you lose all contact with God and all links with God, you cease to be human. Because what makes us human is that we're in his image. And the image would be lost if we lost all contact with God. And when the Bible talks about the second death, that is what it means. That we lose all contact with God and cease to be human beings. Now that is what sin leads to. It's bad enough when someone gets a disease that is going gradually to affect every organ of their body until they die. Until their body dies. That's bad enough. But to know that sin is a disease which is going to do the same to the soul until it's gone, until it's dead, that's worse. Do you wonder that we want to preach the gospel? And do you wonder that the remedy for sin is not to change people's behavior? It's not reformation that people need, it's regeneration. 
It's not a change in their conduct. You can accomplish that in some ways, but all you've changed is a nasty sinner into a nice sinner, and that makes it more difficult for them to realize they're a sinner. You see, God says, I will tackle this disease at the root. I will begin at the real root of it all and start putting it right that way. And the first thing that God puts right when he saves a man from sin is to bring him out from condemnation. That's the first thing he does. He doesn't say, now turn over a new leaf, behave properly. He doesn't say, we'll reform this character. He says, we'll forgive this man. That's where we'll start. We'll get him out from condemnation. And then he says, we'll give him a new nature. We'll so do something for him that he's literally born from God, born from above, born of the Spirit, so that a man now has a new nature a nature that will begin to show in his character, in his conduct. But you see what God is doing. He's not going around reforming people, trying to make them turn over a new leaf. He's saying, let's get down to the root. Let's deal with the condemnation first, the penalty of that second death. Let's deal with that. And then let's give you a new nature. And then God slowly and gradually begins to put the character right and the conduct right. And the man grows in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Why have I said all this to you tonight? Because if the Bible diagnosis is right, the disease can only be tackled this way. If sin is as deep-rooted as that, then it's got to be rooted out at that depth. And that's what salvation means. I'm going to be preaching the next seven or eight Sunday evenings on the rest of this, how God deals with it. But until a man has seen that it's this deep and that he doesn't just need to put right a few besetting sins but that he needs to have the thing rooted out and he needs to be forgiven and set free until a man has seen that it's no use trying to alter his character or his conduct you're starting with the leaves and saying we'll chop the leaves off that are disease and try and stick some new ones on you'll never do it and if you think you can simply reform his character there isn't enough in him to make a saint because he's a sinner in the flesh and in my flesh there dwells no good thing and so Jesus came into the world to save sinners it was a drastic remedy for a terrible disease it involved his own death on the cross and if ever I think that disease is simply a matter of conduct and changing my conduct puts me right with God then I am saying, O oh God, the cross was not necessary in my case. But it was necessary. And the cross went right to the root of condemnation. And Jesus was condemned that we might be forgiven. That's enough for tonight. But I can tell you this in my closing moments. If anyone listening to me has come to realize that this is true, and that this diagnosis is true of your nature and that you're a sinner, the only thing you have to do is to go to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he starts rooting it out from the bottom. It's all you've got to do. You don't need to put your conduct right. You don't need to put your character right. He'll do that. Just come with the deep root problem that you're under condemnation and that you deserve to be. And just say, God, be merciful to me.